This is a story that's been shrouded in secrecy for years. It takes place in an isolated part of Alaska, 200 miles south of the Arctic Circle. The village is called St. Michael, and it's home to some 360 Alaska Native people. As a journalist and as a member of the Shoshone Bannock tribes, I've been writing about Native Americans my whole career, but little could prepare me for what happened in St. Michael. Many here still remember how innocently it all began. Growing up, there are so many good memories. The thing I enjoyed the most was the community gathering. The community being together as one and having fun. It was good to see people happy. My grandpa taught me how to hunt and fish. I used to love to go out with him, go fishing, hunting and trapping. My earliest memories was people who were very devoted Catholics. We went catechism right out of school. We went straight across to the church where we were right next to the Catholic church from the old school. The church in St. Michael was built in the early decades of the 20th century as missionaries helped spread Catholicism across native Alaska. Before the white man came, the Eskimos believed that everything had a spirit. We respected everybody and we knew that there was somebody up there taking care of us. Now almost everybody here is Catholic. To run the parish in St. Michael, the church sent Father George Endall. One of the state's pioneer priests, Endall moved from church to church throughout Alaska before landing in St. Michael in 1968. He brought with him a church volunteer named Joseph Landowski, who he'd given a job to years earlier. We don't know a lot about him. He's somewhat of a mystery. Endall brought him in as a sort of a novice master at the school. He was, we were told, placed in charge of the boys' dormitory. In St. Michael, Landowski would train to become a deacon. But the people here looked up to him as a priest all along. He had a really nice singing voice. His voice was very nice at saying prayers. At the time, I did, worked as altar boy, too, with him. I was the one to be a deacon as a kid. In the beginning, yeah, I wanted to go to catechism. It was fun until weird things started happening. After mass, the parents would start leaving, going home, and Landowski would pull out checkers or chess or um, card games. He'd offer us money or drinks or candy or something we want, you know, to do anything to get us at the church. I was age 12. When he asked me to go in the bedroom with him, I was asking him what for, and he said I would find out, so I follow him in. I was kind of afraid, though, because when he shut the door and locked it, he really put my pants down and he takes his false keys off, put them on a dresser. I was just a kid, didn't know nothing. Father Endall and Joseph Endall, they couldn't stop molesting me when they started. It was almost an everyday thing. Father Endall was telling me that it would make me closer to God. Father Endall and Joe Landowski moved through a series of Alaska villages, always in very remote parts of the state. Uh, always with no one there to supervise them except themselves. They were a law unto themselves and they did whatever they wished. There would be other abusers associated with the church in St. Michael. One seemed to favor exposing himself to girls. When it first happened to me, I was five. I can remember the day putting my head down when I saw him come out with no clothes and I was scared. The next thing I remember, somebody was touching me on my arm. He would 
ask if we wanted to touch his private area and he would say he would give us candy or give us a good prize. This was 1970. It was absolutely unthinkable that the Catholic Church could be involved in the sexual abuse of children. There was nowhere for the kids to hide. There was no one they could talk to. The adults believed the abusers over their own children. It was a perfect storm for molestation. He told us that if we told anybody, they wouldn't believe us because he worked for the church, he worked for God. And he was right. Nobody would believe us. I told my dad what happened in the church. I told him that guy touched me in my mouth and in my bottom. I remember my dad grabbing his belt. He hung me upside down and he beat me. He told me never to blame priests like that. My dad went out. He came back pretty drunk. I saw him holding a pistol in his hand. He looked at my mom and pointed the gun at her. The gun went off. My brother was in front. Bullet pierced both of them. I held him in my arm. My brother didn't have to die just because I told my dad the truth. The abuse in St. Michael would continue for five more years as Ben and the others suffered almost daily molestation. Then, one day, in the summer of 1975, Joseph Landowski would finally be caught in the act. My cousin Martha came and she saw what Joseph was doing and she screamed and she said, oh Ben, I'm gonna go tell, I'm gonna go tell. He went after her and try to give her money or candy just to stop her from talking. She says, no, leave me alone, and then she went running out. As word spread, pressure mounted on Father Endall to act. The police were not called. Even when there was an eyewitness to the abuse, the authorities were not called. The church handled it internally. Landowski was transported out of the town and left the state and as far as we know never returned. But Father Endall stayed. Through it all he remained revered and above suspicion. Although for eight more years he would continue to molest the boys and girls of St. Michael. Under Father Endall's watch nearly 80 percent of the town's children Literally, an entire generation were molested. The odds of being abused as a little Catholic boy or a little Catholic girl in that diocese was staggeringly high, higher than any other place in the United States that has ever been investigated to date. There's a lot of people that will not acknowledge this pain. The hurts and the suffering here, you can tell in their eyes they're trying to run away from it, but they, it's always there. Ultimately, several dozen priests and church workers would be named as abusers. Not just in St. Michael, but in Alaska native villages across the state. Few were as widely known at the time as Father James Poole the host of a popular Catholic radio program. Poole was once profiled by People magazine as one of Alaska's hippest DJs. But decades later, he would be named as an abuser by almost 20 different girls and women. The first to step forward was Elsie Boudreau. Father Poole would have me sit on his lap, strangling his legs, and we would French kiss for hours. He would tell me that he was my friend and that he was my brother 
my father, and my lover. Boudreaux said the abuse lasted for almost 10 years. And on one occasion, she said, Poole raped her. Finally, she moved away and made a new life for herself in Anchorage. Were you going to watch the game? Yeah. Did he have it recorded? She married and started a family. Mm -hmm. But then, she said, the memories of the abuse became inescapable. When my daughter turned 10, the age that I was when the abuse began, it was really hard to shield the fact that I was sexually abused. It was like flooding my consciousness. Boudreaux turned to the Catholic Church for answers, but couldn't get anyone to talk to her. Finally, she got the attention of the new bishop, Donald Kettler, who'd just come from South Dakota to lead the Fairbanks Diocese. I met Bishop Kettler. I identified that I was a sexual abuse victim of Father Poole's, and I just laid it all out and talked about how hurtful it had been to have come forward and to not get a response from anyone from the church, to not be acknowledged, not be validated, not be comforted, nothing. He didn't get it. The Catholic Church abuse story was breaking around the country in 2002, and Boudreaux decided to call a lawyer. Ken Rosa was a former Anchorage prosecutor who just begun to investigate abuse claims across Alaska. Each time as we identified a new molester, it would open up a new group of victims because no victim wanted to be the first one to say something about a priest until they found out somebody else had made a complaint against their perpetrator and then they would go, wow, I'm not the only one. My name is Elsie Boudreaux. Uh, my Yupik name is Abuhin. Boudreaux filed suit against the church, and then she decided to go public. We ask that the church stop hindering the criminal and civil prosecution of men who have abused our children and the people who have covered up the crimes. As the story unfolded, dozens more victims came forward. This time, Attorney Rosa filed a class action focused mostly on the abuse of Joseph Landowski in St. Michael. It's pretty clear from the evidence that Landowski molested every male child he could get his hands on. He lived and breathed every moment of every day to molest boys. The public spotlight now fell on Bishop Donald Kettler, who was forced to respond to claims about Landowski on the local news. I was completely surprised. I did not know anything about this or that I didn't know who this gentleman was. All I can tell you, all that I know, is that he was listed um, as, a, as a volunteer in some of our... The bishop first denied any church responsibility for Landowski. Then he said the church had no knowledge of his abuse. There's nothing that we have found that would indicate that Landowski sexually abused any children. Nothing that we found. But Ken Rosa turned up new information from the church's own files. We looked at documents to prove to the church that Joe worked for them and extracted all the evidence and then gave it back to them and said, Now, tell me Joe Landowski didn't work for you. In the end, the evidence proved undeniable. The claims against Joseph